wonderful news that it is. We love thee so much. And these things we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I also welcome you this evening as uh, we speak about the Godhead and each member of the Godhead. I'm going to start this evening in John chapter 17, verse 3, which is known as the great intercessory prayer given the last night of the incarnate God's life, Jesus the Christ. It's a significant uh, chapter that deals with the members of the church. In verse 3, a verse that uh, we have memorized over the years, we have been taught many times, we read the following. The Savior said, and this is life eternal, that they, the antecedent of they is mainly in verse 2, which deals with the doctrine of election, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, know to have eternal life, we must come to know the Father and the Son. We have helps in doing so, two places. One, the standard works of the church reveal the type of being that the Father and the Son are, and then the teachings of the apostles and prophets in our dispensation. This evening, I will draw on both of those as we speak about the Godhead. Let's turn now to Acts chapter 17. And I'm going to start with verse uh, 28, Acts 17, verse 28. Here we read, For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, For we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Perhaps the greatest revelation that's ever been given upon this earth is the revelation wherein our Father in heaven revealed the type of being that he is and our relationship to him. Also, the greatest distortion has come by Satan wherein he has distorted the type of being that God is and man's relationship to him. Elder Boyd K. Packer said this in General Conference. He said, No greater ideal has been revealed than the supernal truth that we are the children of God and we differ by virtue of our creation from all other living things. No idea has been more destructive of happiness. No philosophy has produced more sorrow, more heartbreak, and mischief no idea has done more to destroy the family than the idea that we are not the offspring of God. Only advanced animals compelled to yield to every carnal urge. The reference for that is Boyd K. Packer, Conference Report, April 1992, page 93. As we go through this lesson this evening, I'll try and give you all of the references that you can draw upon as well as a suggested outline. I'd like to speak now for a minute about the titles that reflect the type of being that our Father in Heaven is. First, He is God, which denotes a supreme being who has all powerful. Two, He is called Elohim. Eloi equals God, it means God. Uh, him in the Hebrew is always plural. Whenever you see that, it's plural. So when we refer to God as Elohim, we are saying he is God of gods. Let's go now to 1 Corinthians, the teachings of the Apostle Paul, to chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'll start with verse 5. He says this, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. Joseph Smith said that means exactly what it says. But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by him. 
God's many, Lord's many, but we are subject only to one, to our Father in heaven, and to his Holy Son. Let's go now to Moses 7, where we see other titles of our Father in heaven. These were revealed to the great Antediluvian seer Enoch. So Moses chapter 7. And uh, we're going to start verse 35. It was revealed to Enoch the following, Behold, I am God. Man of holiness is my name. Man of counsel is my name. And endless and eternal is my name also. We pick up three more titles there of our Father in heaven. Man of counsel denotes that his counsel and his direction is perfect. Man of holiness denotes the type of being that God is. He is a man. Of denotes belonging to or ownership or possession. He is the man of holiness. He is a perfected man who has all of the attributes in their fullness. Almond, I might mention to you, is a name that's closely akin to the title man of holiness. It has not been revealed exactly what that name means. It comes out of the Adamic tongue. One day, surely, we will know exactly what it means. Endless and eternal. Elder McConkie said the following. He said, we have an authentic account which can be accepted as true that life has been going on in this system for almost 2,555,000,000 years. Presumably, this system is the universe created by the Father through the instrumentality of the Son. Our Father in heaven, at least, has been an exalted being for 200,555,000,000 years. No wonder he says that his name is endless and eternal. There's no way you can fathom or relate to that kind of a figure, 2 billion uh, plus. I, I might mention to you also that that comes out of the times and seasons in an article written by W.W. Phelps, who received the information from Joseph Smith. The source I just read from Bruce R. McConkie is The Mortal Messiah, and it's book one, page 29 and 30, The Mortal Messiah, book one, volume one, page 29 and 30. But perhaps, and most important of all, we are told to refer to God as Father. We're here to call him Father. That denotes our relationship to him. In the prayer that the Savior taught the disciples in Matthew 6, he said we are to pray to our Father in heaven. And that shows great respect in our relationship to him. He is our loving Father in heaven. Now let's speak for a minute about his character and his attributes. He is omniscient, which means that God knows everything. The prophet Joseph Smith said this. He said, without the knowledge of all things, God would not be able to save any portion of his creatures. For it is by reason of the knowledge which he has of all things from the beginning to the end that enables him to give that understanding to his creatures by which they are made partakers of eternal life. And if it were not for the idea existing in the minds of men that God had all knowledge, it would be impossible for them to exercise faith in him. That comes from Lectures on Faith, page 5152. Let's turn now for a minute to 2 Nephi chapter 9 in the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi 9. And the reference we want here is verse 20, 2 Nephi 9, verse 20. Here we read, Oh, how great the holiness of our God, for he knoweth all things. There's not anything save he knows it. That is not an isolated passage. There are multiple references in the Book of Mormon particularly and the Doctrine and Covenants that teach that God knows all things. Let me just show you one which explains how it is God knows all things. It's Doctrine and Covenant section 88. 
great revelation given to the prophet Joseph Smith. Section 88, verse uh, 41. We read, he comprehendeth all things, and all things are before him, all things are round about him, and he is above all things, and in all things, and is through all things, and is round about all things, and all things are by him, and of him, even God forever and ever. There is the explanation, even though difficult for a finite mind to understand, as to how it is that God knows and understands all things. Joseph Hilly Smith, as uh, a new president of the church in general conference, testified as follows. He said, we know that our Heavenly Father is a glorified, exalted personage who has all power, all might, and all dominion, and that he knows all things. That's Joseph Hilly Smith, conference report, April 1971, page 4. <laughs> We have Joseph Smith, up, uh, and including Joseph Fielding Smith, then both testify that God knows all things, and the scriptures teach that he knows all things. Another one of his characteristics, attributes, is he is omnipresent. President Brigham Young said, Some would have us believe that God is present everywhere. It is not so. He is no more everywhere present in person than the Father and Son are one in person. That's Journal of Discourses, Volume 6, page 345. And then he clarifies and adds to that by saying this. God is considered to be everywhere present at the same moment. And the psalmist says, Whether shall I flee from thy presence? He is present with all his creations through his influence, through his government, spirit and power but he himself is a personage of tabernacle and we are made after his likeness there is a little glimpse of how it is that he is omnipresent that's journal of discourses volume 10 page 319 third he is omnipotent meaning he has all power let's go now to the book of mosiah to chapter 3, Mosiah chapter 3. And we want to look here at verse 5. Here we read, For behold, the time cometh, and is not far distant, that with power the Lord omnipotent, who reigneth, who was, and is from all eternity to all eternity, shall come down from heaven among the children of men and shall dwell in the tabernacle of clay. That is a direct reference to the Son of God, but what is said about one being is said about the other one. And as God has all power, so also does his Son. Thus we learn that he is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Therefore, he has power to save his creations. If it were not so, he could not do it. Now another heading. God once walked an earth the same as we walk this one. There's a lot of help involved with this, but we're going to start tonight in the book of Philippians in the New Testament with the teachings of the Apostle Paul, who is blessed with great knowledge and great understanding of the gospel. So Philippians chapter 2, and we'll start with verse 5, Philippians 2 verse 5. He said this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And then Elder Packer also gives us some help with this. He said, when the early apostles were gone, those who assumed the leadership of the church forsook revelation and relied on reason. The idea of three separate gods offended them, for it appeared to contravene those scriptures which refer to one God. To reconcile that problem, they took verses here and there and ignored all else that bears on the subject. 
They tried to stir the three ones together into some mysterious kind of a composite one. They come up with creeds which cannot be squared with the scriptures. They were left with a philosophy which opposes all we know of creation, of the laws of nature, and that interesting enough defies the very reason upon which they came to depend. The Apostle Paul understood this doctrine and wrote to the Philippians, and then he quotes verse 5 and 6 that we've read. Lorenzo Snow, a modern apostle, wrote a poem to his ancient counterpart Paul, from which I quote only one verse. A son of God, like God to be, would not be robbed in deity, and he who has this hope within him will purify himself from sin. That reference is Boyd K. Packer, Conference Report, October 1984, page 84. Lorenzo Snow, in the early spring of 1840, had been called uh, on a mission to England to labor there with the Quorum of the Twelve. Lorenzo Snow was a member of the Quorum of the Seventy at the time. He will not be put into the Quorum of the Twelve until February 1849. As he was en route to his mission, he stayed at the house of Elder H. G. Sherwood, who becomes prominent in the church. He said that night I listened to him as he endeavored to explain the parable of our Savior speaking about the husband and who hired the servants and sent them forth at different hours. He said while he was doing this, he said I listened attentively to his explanation. He said the Spirit of the Lord rested upon me, the eyes of my understanding were opened, and I saw as clear as the sun at noonday with wonder and astonishment the pathway of God and man. And then he formed this couplet that has become so well known. As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be. He shared that with nobody, that revelation to him, except to his sister, Eliza R. Snow. He told her the information he had received from heaven. And when he got to England, he shared it with President Brigham Young. President Brigham Young taught him a great lesson. He said, Lorenzo, that is a revelation that was given direct to you, uh, directly to you. You are not to speak of it to the members of the church. It was a private communication to you. If God wants the church to know that, it'll come through the proper channel. It'll be revealed to Joseph Smith, which it was in the King Follett Discourse. Now, brothers and sisters, we give Lorenzo Snow uh, credit for the couplet, but not for the revelation to the church. That revelation that God once walked on earth uh, as we are comes from the prophet Joseph Smith. He's the one that revealed it to the church. Bless Lorenzo Snow's heart, who was obedient to the counsel of the senior apostle uh, of the Quorum of the Twelve, Brigham Young, in 1840 in England, who listened to him. But the couplet is kind of stuck even to the point that we attribute the knowledge of that to Lorenzo Snow. Be aware that our understanding comes from Joseph Smith. So let me give you some help with that as to what Joseph Smith had to say. In the King Follett discourse, King Follett, remember, was killed digging a well in Nauvoo. The rope that was taken, the bucket of heavy rock out, broke and it came down and crushed him. And it, as it was at his funeral that Joseph Smith gave what's become known as the King Follett Discourse. In that discourse, he said this, God himself was once as we are now, and is an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. <clears throat> if the veil were rent today, and the great God who holds this world in its orbit, who upholds all worlds and all things by his power, was to make himself visible, <laughs> I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves and all the person, image, and very form as a man. For Adam was created in the very fashion, image, and likeness of God, and received instruction from, and walked, talked, and conversed with him as one man talks and communes with another. Then the prophet goes on and he says this, it is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty of the character of God, to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another, that he was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the Father of us all, dwelled on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did, 
and I will show it from the Bible, and then he goes to some explanation of that. And then he gives what's become known as the Sermon in the Grove, a sermon that members of the church, many are not aware of and have not taken time to read. I might mention, I'm sorry, that the King Follett Discourse, you can find that in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 345 to 347. The Sermon in the Grove was given June 16, 1844, 11 days before the martyrdom that took place on June 27, 1844. This seems to be the climax of his great teachings about God the Father. He said this, If Abraham reasoned thus, if Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and John discovered that God and Father of Jesus Christ had a father, you may suppose that he had a father also. Where was there ever a son without a father? And where was there ever a father without first being a son? Hence, if Jesus had a father, can we not believe that he had a father also? That is absolutely mind-boggling. And there's no way that a mortal with a finite man can even begin to comprehend that. Especially after I read to you that our Father in Heaven has been an exalted being for over two billion years. Joseph Smith said he had a father who had a father who had a father. And that there is no end to the race of the gods. W.W. Phelps seemed to capture that with a hymn he wrote, If You Could Hide a Kolob. You might want to take at least a look at least at the first uh, uh, line of that again and see what he said. Now the Sermon in the Grove is vol uh, History of the Church, Volume 6. Page 476, it's longer now, but that's the page uh, from which I took the quote that I just shared with you. Now, Joseph Smith also said this. Our text says, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. The apostles have discovered that there were gods above, for Paul says God was the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. My object was to preach the scriptures and preach the doctrine they can contain, there being a God above the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am bold to declare I have taught all the strong doctrines publicly and always teach stronger doctrines in public than in private. That's from the teachings of Joseph Smith, page 370. Also, you might want to look at page 373. Now we turn to what I think is the most important part of this member of the Godhead, and that's our relationship to God the Father. And this becomes most significant to understand this. So I'm going to start in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Again, the teachings of the Apostle Paul. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9, a missionary scripture that uh, all of us who have served in the mission field use this. The Apostle Paul says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, flesh which corrected us. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father's spirits and live? Live there means the eternal life. If we are not obedient to our Father in heaven, we will not have eternal life. So the Apostle Paul clearly teaches that God, the Eternal Father, is the Father of our spirits. That all members of the church, I think, understand. The next part that we'll explore is not as easily understood. And I'm going to give you a lot of references for this to help you. Our Heavenly Father is the Father of our physical bodies. Joseph Smith said this. He said, An everlasting covenant was made between three personages before the organization of this earth and relates to their dispensation of things to men on the earth. These personages, and now he's going to quote Abraham who knew this doctrine, these personages, according to Abraham's record, are called God the first, the creator. God the second, the Redeemer, and God the third, the witness or testator. Now he's speaking of the creation of the earth and the role of the Godhead uh, with man upon the earth. We understand God the Redeemer, that's Christ, the Atonement. We understand God the Testator, the Holy Ghost. Why is it the Father is called God the Creator? 
We know that Christ is the one under the direction of the Father who created the earth. So when it says God the creator, it has reference that he created man. No one else had that responsibility that rested with the Father. Now here's where I'll give you references that will help you with the doctrine. First, let's start in Luke chapter 3 in the New Testament. Luke chapter 3, where we get a genealogy that deals with the Savior. My interest is not to explore uh, the complete list, but let's just start with uh, verse 36, Luke 3, 36. He is tracing the genealogy of the fathers the way I would. I would uh, write, my name's Calvin Stevens. My dad's name was Roy Stevens. His dad was Robert Stevens. That's what he's doing here. So verse 36, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphax, which was the son of Sem, which was the son of Noah, which was the son of Lamech, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Malil, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. It means exactly what it says. Now, Elder McConkey, we turn to him and quote him. He said, Adam, which was the son of God, this statement's also found in Moses chapter 6, verse 22, has a deep and profound significance and also means what it says. Father Adam came as indicated to this sphere, gaining an immortal body because death had not yet entered the world. Jesus, on the other hand, was the only begotten in the flesh, meaning into a world of mortality where death already reigned. Our Father in heaven gave life to Adam and Eve's physical bodies, but they're immortal beings. They cannot die. They're in a state of innocence. Whatever the fruit was that they partook of sent blood through their veins, and they become fallen man, subject to mortality, and thus came mankind. So if I was to trace my genealogy, eventually I would trace my physical body to Father Adam, who received his physical body from God the Father. Man is far more noble than what the world understands, but members of the church understand. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. This is the writings of the great prophet Moses. Genesis 21, verse 26, 27. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In other words, man is the apex of the creation. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female, created them. Now you know that I didn't give any information as to how the Father created Adam or Eve. Those things are sacred and do not uh, require us to speak of or begin to teach. Surely we understand. President Nelson said this. He said, we are dual beings. Each soul is comprised of body and spirit, both of which emanate from God. A firm understanding of body and spirit will shape our thoughts and deeds for good. That's Russell M. Nelson, Conference Report, October 1998, page 110. Elder McConkie, uh, another quote from him, he says this, God first of the human family. Let me comment first upon the expression that God is the first of the human family. This same doctrine was taught by Joseph Smith. It is a fundamental doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. According to the teachings of Joseph Smith, he beheld the Father and the Son in his glorious vision, and he taught that each had a body of flesh and bones. He has expressed it in these words. And then he quotes DNC 130. He also taught that literally God is our Father that men are of the same race, the race called humans, and that God, the progenerator or creator, is the father of the human race. 
In the image of his own body, male and female, created he them and blessed them, called their name Adam in the day when they were created and became living souls in the land upon the footstool of God. It is a doctrine common to the Latter-day Saints that God, the great Elohim, is the first or creator of the human family. That's Doctrinal New Testament Commentary, Volume 1, page 95. Brigham Young stated, It must be that God knows something about temporal things and has a body, and been on an earth were it not so, he would not know how to judge men righteously according to the temptations and sin they have had to contend with. Our Father in heaven beget all the spirits that ever were, or ever will be upon this earth, and they were born spirits in the eternal world. Then the Lord, by his power and wisdom, organized the mortal tabernacle of man. We were made first spiritual and afterwards temporal. He is our Father. He is our God, the Father of our spirits. He is the framer of our bodies and set the machine in successful operation to bring forth these tabernacles that I now look upon in this building and all that ever did or ever will live on the face of the whole earth. The apostles and prophets, when speaking of our relationship to God, say that we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. God is our Father, Jesus Christ is our elder brother, and both our everlasting friends. That's Discourses of Brigham Young, page 3738. That's uh, John A. Witzel, as the, did the editorial work on the book. John Taylor said this, our spirits are eternal and emanate from God. So we as a people have always understood and do understand today. We possess our bodies also, and they also emanated from God. The Bible tells us something in relation to these matters in tracing our genealogies. Who was Seth? He was the son of Adam. Who was Adam? The son of God. In another place, we are told that all we are his offspring. That is, according to that, we are all the offspring of God. John Taylor, Journal of Discourses, volume 26, page 33. I'm going to share one more, and I know that this is extensive, given this much information, but it seems to be a doctrine that we don't understand too much, and so I want to make sure that you who are listening tonight are aware that there are multiple sources that explain how God is the father of mankind. Now, brethren, this is Heber C. Kimball. Now, brethren, you've got a spirit in you, and that spirit was created and organized, was born and begotten by our Father and our God before we ever took these bodies. And these bodies were formed by him and through him and of him, just as much as the spirit was. For I will tell you, he commenced and brought forth spirits. And then when he completed that work, he commenced and brought forth tabernacles, for those spirits to dwell in, I came through him, both spirit and body. God made the elements that they are made of just as much as he made anything. Tell me the first thing that is made on earth that God did not organize and place here in this world. Not a thing. Heber C. Kimball, Journal of Discourses, Volume 6, page 31. Now let's turn to one other thing that I think is important to understand. Our Father in Heaven does not have two counselors as members of the Godhead. The Godhead, if you were to draw circles, you'd put them in a vertical column so that the Father presides over the Son and the Son over the Holy Ghost, and of course the Father over the Holy Ghost also. We have a tendency when we think of the uh, First Presidency of Heaven of thinking of it like a bishopric or a stake presidency. A stake president does need two counselors. The bishop needs two counselors, but the father doesn't. And so the Godhead would be in a vertical column, father over son, son over the Holy Ghost. Joseph Ealing Smith said this, Jesus is greater than the Holy Spirit, which is subject unto him, but his father is greater than he. Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 1, page 18. Now, we speak of God the Father and... Uh, some of the things that might uh, be of help to you here.
Let me just mention to you that it was God the Father who was in the Garden of Eden. It is God the Father who has appeared on multiple occasions to various prophets. I just list some that might be of interest to you. Joseph Smith saw our Father in Heaven many times, at least five that I can think of. Harvey Whitlock and also um, Lyman White at the June 3rd, 1831 conference saw the Father in vision was permitted. Newell Knight sees the Father and the Son on June 1st, 1830 at uh, Fayette, New York in General Conference where he was told by the Savior that where he lived, the son lived, that Newell Knight would one day live also. He's the first man I know sealed to eternal life. Zebedee Coltrane saw the father and son. The School of the Prophets commenced January 24, 1833, was disbanded the middle of April, 1833. Sometime during that period of time, it appears it was in March of 33. Joseph Smith introduced 21 men to the Father and the Son. Whether or not they all saw the Father, I don't know. But Zebedee Coltrane testified that he did. He saw the Father and he saw the Son. And then another one that maybe you have not heard of, his name is James Marsh. He is the son of Thomas B. Marsh. When he was nine years old, he saw God the Father and Jesus the Christ. He saw many of the ancient prophets. He saw the second coming. And by the age of 14, he died. Completed apparently whatever it was our Father in Heaven wanted him to do. And he was taken into the paradise. He's buried at Far West, Missouri. We know now where the, by the way, where the cemetery is at uh, Far West. And the church purchased that a few years ago. We do own the property where that happened. I want to turn my attention now to uh, Jesus the Christ. He's called God the Second, the Redeemer. President Dallin Oaks said, The atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ has been called the most transcendent of all events, from creation's dawn to the endless ages of eternity. That sacrifice is a central message of all of the prophets. That's Enzyme. May 2012, page 19. Let's turn now for a minute to 1 Peter, to chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1. Joseph Smith said of Peter that of all of the apostles, the writings of Peter were the most sublime. When we turn here, we're reading the writings of the president of the church of Jesus Christ. That's how important this is. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, and that is a requirement, only he could work out the atonement, because throughout all of the eternities before he came to earth, as well as while he was here, he never sinned. Thus the law of justice could not come down on him. He was a perfect, spotless being, who verily was foreordained, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, foreordained in pre-earth life by God the Eternal Father to work out the atonement. Let's go now to Genesis chapter 3, which is the first recorded reference of the atonement given so long ago in Eden when Adam and Eve had partaken of the fruit. The verse is somewhat difficult. I think I'll read it once, and then I'll go back through and offer an explanation. Genesis 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, let's look at it again, only we'll unlock the symbols. And I, God the Father, will put enmity, enmity is hatred or deep-seated dislike, between thee, Satan, and the woman. The woman is the church. Between thy, thy is Satan's seed. His seed are those who uphold him, the one-third cast out with him, but also all who uphold him on the earth. And her seed, her is Mary. 
There's only been one woman who ever lived on this earth who was able to have seed or a child without the help of a mortal man. And so her is Mary, seed is Christ. It, and in the Hebrew it reads better. In the Hebrew it should read uh, he. He, Christ, shall bruise thy head. And again in the Hebrew it reads crush. Now to crush someone's head is to destroy them. Thy head is Satan, and thou, Satan, shalt bruise his Christ heel. Now, to have your heel bruised is very, very painful and takes a long time to heal. Wherein did Satan bruise Christ's heel? In the atonement process, which we don't even begin to understand. All hell was turned loose on Christ that night uh, in the garden and later on the cross. Cross. We have no idea what it was that he had to go through. It was infinite suffering, we do know that. And thus he bruised his head. But in process, Christ worked out the atonement, and now Satan's head or kingdom will be crushed. Victory has gone to God and to his Holy Son. The only thing left undone is how many of us as members of the church are going to come under the full umbrella of the atonement and have eternal life. And thus the Savior allows mortality to continue to serve his purposes and to bring about the exaltation of his children. Let's go now to the book of Psalms. There's two books in the Old Testament that's got all of the answers in them, both of which we have a tendency to shy from. One is Psalms, the other is Isaiah. So I'm going to go to Psalms chapter 22 which teaches something about the atonement that generally we don't think about. Note in the heading that this is a messianic psalm. It says, verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. I know that that has dualism, deals with King David, but my interest is how it's messianic and it deals with Christ. When I was a member of the stake presidency, we had Elder Theodore M. Burton come to our conference. I can still hear him in the general session as he said that the Son of God was afraid that he would blow it, that he couldn't do it. Generally, we never think of that as though it's a, just an automatic. It's a given. He's the Son of God, so he worked out the atonement. Not realizing that there was fear and emotion involved with it, and that's what this deals with, is prior to the atonement, he was concerned, and he prayed and sought his Father diligently to strengthen him and to help him. And that which he'd prepared for from eternity to be the Redeemer was now within weeks and in days that he would commence this infinite suffering to bring about the salvation of God's children. Let me show you just one thing of how he received some help. Now I'm going to do this by going to Mosiah chapter 14. This is the teachings of Abinadi. He's reading, quoting in this chapter Isaiah 53. So we're going to start in Mosiah 14, verse 10. It reads, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, that's the atonement, he shall see his seed. Now my interest tonight is who, is, who are his seed. Let's go over to Mosiah 15, and a verse, uh, let's start with verse 10. He says, Now I say unto you, who shall declare his generation? Behold, I say unto you that when his soul has been made an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And now what say ye? Who shall be his seed? Abinadi is going to explain it. Behold, I say unto you that whosoever has heard the words of the prophets, miss a couple of lines, all those who uh, have hearkened unto their words, who are his seed? It is the prophets and the members of the church who hear the teachings of the prophets and then do what they are asked to do by the brethren. Now, with that in mind, we've identified who his seed are. 
Note that Isaiah said at the height of his suffering, he would what? He would see his seed. Here's what Elder Merrill Bateman said in General Conference of General Authority. He said, the Savior is a member of the Godhead, knows each of us personally. Isaiah and the prophet Abinadi said that when Christ would make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Abinadi explains that his seed are the righteous, those who follow the prophets. In the garden and on the cross, Jesus saw each of us and not only bore our sins, but also experienced our deepest feelings so they would know how to comfort and strengthen us. Note, at the height of his suffering in Gethsemane and on the cross, he saw us, each of us as individuals. How that must have touched his tender heart, knowing that if he did not finish what he started in that atonement process, all of us were lost. And we were not anybody, brothers and sisters. In pre-earth life, we were loyal to the Father and the Son. And we strove to obey them and to keep their commandments. Thus they have blessed us in mortality with membership in the church, with the priesthood, and callings to grow, to learn, and to serve. Now, Elder Bateman's statement that he gave comes out of the conference report, April 1995, page 15 and 16. Now, quoting Elder James E. Talmage, he said, Christ's agony in the garden is unfathomable by the infinite mind, both as to intensity and cause. Again, on the cross, he gives this great insight. He said, it seems that in addition to the fearful suffering incident to crucifixion, the agony of Gethsemane had reoccurred, intensified beyond human power to endure. In that bitterest hour, the dying Christ was alone alone and most terrible reality. That supreme sacrifice of the Son might be consummated in all its fullness. The Father seems to withdraw the support of his immediate presence, leaving to the Savior of men the glory of complete victory over the forces of sin. That's page 661 in Jesus the Christ. Elder McConkie, a second witness, says this, In Gethsemane he bowed beneath a load none other could bear. There he sweat great gouts of blood from every pore as he bore the sins of us all on conditions of repentance. Again on Calvary, during the last three hours of his mortal passion, the sufferings of Gethsemane returned. He drank to the full the cup which his heavenly Father had given him. Note that that which started in Gethsemane climaxed on the cross. And both Elder Talmage and Elder McConkie believed that he went through on the cross what he'd gone through in Gethsemane. Thus, I suggest to you tonight that his greatest suffering was on the cross. And why? Because now he's nailed in a rigid position. He cannot move. He can't twist or lay down or curl up. And he has to endure <coughs> the pains of an infinite suffering by an infinite being. Elder McConkie's uh, statement comes from the Ensign, November 1982, page 32. The atonement process then, brothers and sisters, commenced in Gethsemane and climaxed on the cross, wherein John chapter 19, verse 30, he said, it is finished. The atonement process is not finished, but the overcoming of spiritual death is and the satisfying of the law of justice and its demands is satisfied, which required infinite suffering to do. Now he commences the second part of the atonement, and that's physical death and the resurrection. The resurrection will complete the process. Mosiah 15 is clear that he was even tempted after all of that not to die. And why? Because gods don't die. Gods live forever. But he would not yield even to that, and he willingly surrendered himself to death and his spirit come out of his body. In Doctrine and Covenants section 19 is one of the few places in all of Scripture where the Savior reports to the members of his church about his suffering in uh, the atonement process. So I'd like to look at that for 
just a minute. These are verses that we, uh, all of us are familiar with, but they also contain a warning that we want to make sure we heed. Section 19, I'm going to start with verse 15. Therefore, I command you to repent. Note, it's a commandment. Repent, lest I smite you by the rod of my mouth, by my wrath, by my anger. Anybody in their right mind want to find out what it would be like to have a God upset with them? And your sufferings be sore. How sore you know not. How exquisite. Exquisite denotes uh, a perfection of the suffering. You know not. Yea, how hard to bear. Ye know not. Hard there means difficult. We have no idea the requirement on our part. If we will not repent, then we must satisfy the demands of justice ourselves, which means that we must suffer. There's two ways the demands are satisfied of justice. One is by sincere repentance. We receive mercy from Christ because he's already paid uh, and satisfied the demands of justice. If we do not want to repent or won't repent, then you'll find out what this is about. And you will have to suffer and make payment on your own, and nobody in this church wants to have to do this. Behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all. Now the emphasis there is on God. For all that they might not suffer if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I. Which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, no one to tremble because of pain, two to bleed at every pore. And Elder Talmadge, by the way, says that's impossible. A human being can't do it. You'll black out first. Three, to suffer both body and spirit, even the spirit in his body is in terrible pain. And would that I might drink, not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Shrink means to pull back. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father. Nevertheless denotes divine determination. He will not get up and walk out of that garden or come off of the cross till he's done what the Father's asked. And I partook and finished my preparation unto the children of men. One of the few places where the Savior reports to us gives us a glimpse of what he went through and a warning to the members of the church. Now the following titles all deal with the atonement. Jesus Christ deals with the atonement. Christ is the Greek word that means the anointed. Jesus denotes savior or salvation or redeemer. He's called the lamb. Whenever you see lamb used in scriptures, in some way it deals with the atonement. He's called the only begotten. He's called the savior, the redeemer, the Messiah. Messiah is the Hebrew for the one who is anointed. Now we turn our attention next to the Holy Ghost. He is called God the Third, the witness or testator. We'll start in Doctrine and Covenants section 130, verse 22, this great revelation to the prophet Joseph Smith. Again, a reference that most of us have memorized and quoted multiple times in multiple settings. 130, verse 22. He says, the father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but as a personage of spirit, were it not so, the Holy Ghost could not dwell in us. The Holy Ghost, according to D&C section 35, verse 19, teaches us that the Holy Ghost also knows all things. Let's turn our attention now to Moses chapter 6. To verse 61. Again, the writings and teachings of Enoch. Moses chapter 6, verse 61. We read, Therefore it, it is the Holy Ghost, is given to abide in you. He is the record of heaven. He's traversed the eternities with the Father and Son. He has all knowledge. He knows what the Father and Son would do in any circumstance. Thus he bears record of them. He is called the Comforter. He's called the peaceable things of immortal glory. 
He's called the truth of all things, that which quickeneth all things, that which maketh alive all things, that which knoweth all things, and hath all power, according to wisdom, mercy, truth, justice, and judgment. Note then at least three things there. One, he is the record of heaven. Two, he is the giver of peace. And three, the teacher of truth. I suggest to you on the giver of peace, DNC 59 verse 23 is most helpful, wherein the Savior said, but learn that he who doeth uh, the ways of righteousness shall receive his gifts, even peace in this life and eternal life in the world to come. Peace is the greatest gift you can have in mortality. It is the unspeakable gift that comes from the Holy Ghost. And that which naturally will fall it in the world to come is eternal life. Let's turn now to 1 Nephi chapter 10, where again there's significant teachings about the Holy Ghost that we want to make sure that we catch this evening. So 1 Nephi chapter 10. And uh, verse 17, we read, And it came to pass after I, Nephi, having heard all the words of my father concerning the things which he saw in a vision, and also the things which he spake by the power of the Holy Ghost, which power he received by faith on the Son of God. No, there's a requirement. To have the companionship of the Holy Ghost, you must have faith in Christ. Was the, and the Son of God was the Messiah who should come. I, Nephi, was desirous also that I might see and hear and know of these things by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, this next phrase is critical that we catch it. We read this, which is the gift of God unto all those who diligently seek him. If you want the companionship of the Holy Ghost, you must what? Diligently seek him. We should pray every morning on a daily basis for the companionship of the Holy Ghost to bless our lives through the day. Verse 19, for he that diligently seeketh shall find the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto them by the power of the Holy Ghost as well in these times as in times of old and as well in times of old as in times to come. Wherefore, the curse of the Lord is one eternal course of the Lord is one eternal round. Note that the Holy Ghost has been involved with members of the church since the days of Adam. It's not just a gift that was given to us in our dispensation, but as a gift that has been given to the members of the church from the beginning, even from the time of Adam. Now, the mission and work of the Holy Ghost. Some of these I'm just going to list for you. A few of them I'm going to turn to and offer an explanation. First, number one, he bears record of the Father and Son. That's one of his assignments. Two, he is a sanctifier. He cleanses. This one I want to look at by going to 3 Nephi, chapter 27. So 3 Nephi, chapter 27. And let's see, verse 20. 3 Nephi 27, chapter 27, verse 20. Now this is the commandment. Repent all ye ends of the earth. Come unto me, be baptized in my name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. Note then, the Holy Ghost sanctifies. He's called uh, sometimes the baptism of fire. The fire cleanses as though it burns the sin or the transgression out of us, that we might stand clean before God. Number three. He is called the Holy Spirit of Promise. Let's turn to Doctrine and Covenants, section 132. This one becomes critical. As an ecclesiastical leaders, leader, I had opportunities where I've had, generally it was women, not men, ask me this question. They'd been married in the temple, and they would say to me, do I have to live with my husband in the next life? He mistreated me, and I don't want to be with him. They don't understand. 
unless the Holy Ghost ratifies the ordinance, is not valid and will not stand in the eternities, and he's not going to ratify an ordinance if there's contention and problems. But let's look at DNC 132, verse 7. And verily I say unto you that the conditions of this law are these, all covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations that are not made and entered into and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise of him who is anointed, that's the presence of the church, both as well for time and for all eternity. He holds the sealing power. The Holy Ghost must ratify all saving ordinances as they deal with us as individuals till he has put his stamp of approval on the ordinance. It is not valid into the eternal worlds. He will not seal a temple marriage until both parties have proven that they're loyal, that they'll keep God's commandments. Then he will seal. We should understand that, that the Holy Ghost must ratify and seal all ordinances. Thus the title, Holy Spirit of Promise. Number four, he is called the Comforter, John 14, 26. But John 14, 26 teaches something else that I'm just going to mention to you this evening. It says that he will bring all things to our remembrance. Have you not wondered as you studied the Book of Mormon, how is it that Alma could write down all of Abinadi's discourse? Surely he didn't take shorthand, and surely he didn't sit there in the courts of King Noah writing down the complete discourse. How is it that he was able to do that? Well, the answer is John 14, 26. He did it by the power of the Holy Ghost, who brought it all to his remembrance, that he was able to write down what he had heard. Now, let me suggest something else. Frequently, I have members of the church say to me, I can't remember. I study and, and uh, I go to my meetings, but I can't remember. Brothers and sisters, as you read and as you study, you store truth. You'll never lose it. It's there. You might not can remember it. But if the Holy Ghost, if there is a need, he can bring it out. And he can inspire you in a talk to teach something that you learned a long time ago. And all of a sudden, you can remember it. And you think, you know, I can remember that almost in detail. That's the Holy Ghost that helps us. Number five, he is a revelator. Second Nephi 32, 5, he is a revelator. Number six, the Holy Ghost is a teacher, a teacher. Luke 12, verse 11 and 12. Number seven, he is the one who conveys the spirits, the gifts, to the members of the church. They are found in three places. 1 Corinthians 12, Moroni 10, and Doctrine and Covenants 46. And then finally, this statement of Harold B. Lee. He said, the Savior describes six functions of the Holy Ghost. When Christ bade farewell to his disciples before his crucifixion, he told them that if he went, he would pray to the Father, that he would give them another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, that he might abide with them forever. And then he gave six things that the power of the Comforter or Holy Ghost would do when it came. First, he will teach you all things and mark you. He personalized the Holy Ghost by saying, he, he shall teach you all things. He'll bring all things to your remembrance. He shall testify of me. He will guide you into all truth. He will show you things to come and he will reprove the world of sin. It comes from the teachings of Harold B. Lee, page 15, edited by Clyde Williams. Elder McConkie said this, Though each God in the Godhead is a personage separate and distinct from each of the others, yet they are one God, meaning that they are united as one in the attributes of perfection. For instance, each has the fullness of truth, knowledge, charity, power, justice, judgment, mercy and faith. Accordingly, they all think, act, speak, and are alike in all things, and yet they are three separate and distinct entities. Each occupies space and is and can be in but one place at one time. 
but each has power and influence that is everywhere present. The oneness of the gods is the same unity that should exist among us. I appreciate, brothers and sisters, the privilege to speak about the Godhead this evening. I am thankful for the testimony and conviction I have of the Godhead and of their great work among us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Brother Stevens. We really appreciate the knowledge you shared with us. If I can attain even one one hundredth of that knowledge, I will.